Mike, you're good to go. The subcommittee will come to order. Before I uh, begin my opening statement, uh, I want to welcome our witnesses. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, read some, some technical uh, information, since this is a hybrid hearing, and some members will be uh, joining us remotely. Uh, welcome to today's hearing, uh, Operations in Cyberspace and Building Cyber, cap cyber Capabilities Across the Department of Defense. Uh, we have uh, convened this as a hybrid hearing, and we are joined by members who are participating remotely. Uh, members who are joining remotely uh, must be visible on screen for the purposes of identity verification, establish and maintaining a quorum, participating in the proceeding, and voting. Those members uh, must continue to use the software platform's video function uh, while in attendance unless they experience connectivity issues or other technical problems that render them unable to participate uh, on camera. If a member experiences difficulties, they should contact the committee staff for assistance. Um, uh, video of uh, members' participation will be broadcast in the room and via the television internet feeds. Members participating remotely must seek recognition verbally, uh, and they are asked to mute their microphones uh, when they are not speaking. Uh, members who are participating remotely are reminded to keep the software platform's video function on the entire time they attend the proceeding. Members may leave and rejoin the proceeding. Uh, if members depart for a short while, for reasons other than joining a different proceeding, they should leave the video function on. If members will be absent uh, for a uh, significant period or depart to join a different proceeding, they should exit the software platform entirely and then rejoin uh, it if, the, um, if they return. But members may use the software platform's uh, chat feature to communicate with staff regarding technical or logistical support issues only. Uh, I've designated a committee staff member to, if necessary, mute unrecognized members' microphones to cancel any inadvertent uh, background noise uh, that may disrupt the proceeding. So I'd like to welcome our witnesses, uh, General Paul Nakasone, uh, the commander of U.S. Cyber Command and the director of National Security Agency, and Mike Oyang, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Cyber Policy. I welcome to you both. Uh, in past hearings, General Nakasone, has been joined by Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, for Homeland Defense and Global Security. However, with the challenges faced uh, in, uh, in that role, we are thankful that Ms. Oyang uh, is able to step in, and the committee appreciates your cooperation and collaboration. So it's truly incredible how much has changed since our last cyber posture hearing on March 4, 2020. The world has been upended by a pandemic, changing the lives of literally every person on the planet. Uh, in the realm of cyber matters, the men and women of the Department of Defense, including our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and, and guardians, uh, have had no respite, continuing to operate and defend Americans' interest, uh, Amer Americans' interest in cyberspace. Despite the pandemic, our adversaries and competitors have not let up their cyber uh, campaigns. In the last six months alone, the media has reported almost nonstop on in. in on arguably some of the most significant cyber incidents ever to affect our nation, from solar winds to hafnium uh, to just in the last week, the attack against Colonial Pipeline by the Dockside Criminal Collective. So if there were any uh, doubters that cyberspace uh, is an active and contested uh, warfighting domain, uh, I would hope that, uh, that uh, the last year has changed those uh, perspectives. Yet, uh, incredibly, it, it still appears that um, to this committee that cyber does not always have the, the focus uh, for much of the department's senior uniformed and civilian leadership that it requires, despite our forces uh, engaging uh, adversaries in this domain every single day. I point this out. Uh, recently, the Air Force removed cyber from its mission statement, even though a report from the Office of Secretary of Defense concluded uh, that the inclusion of cyber in the Air Force mission statement is the single reason uh, why Air Force personnel have, uh, have vastly outpaced other services in pursuing cyber-related certifications. Candidly, it's frustrating that uh, the people in this room, both members and witnesses, uh, seem to be fighting an uphill battle to put cyber front and center in the department. Out of five officially recognized warfighting domains, uh, the senior civilian official uh, for air, sea, land, 
and space domains are military service secretaries. Yet, with all due respect to Ms. Ouyang and her spectacularly overworked team, the, civilian, uh, the, the senior civilian for cyber is four rungs lower than her counterparts overseeing other domains. So we also uh, have to account uh, for the ways in which cyberspace operations occur within and affect the information environment. One of the most illustrative examples of how the department's uh, structure can hinder rather than enable uh, uh, operations uh, is its own uh, organization chart. The DOD's uh, joint publication uh, 313 notes that cyberspace is one of many information-related capabilities uh, designed to affect uh, the information domain alongside psychological operations and electromagnetic spectrum operations. Yet each uh, of the information-related capabilities is handled by a, a separate entity and siloed within the department, ensuring uh, that we cannot leverage our capabilities to the maximum extent possible. This needs to change. In our current age of great power competition, conflict in the gray zone below the level of armed conflict has never been more relevant uh, to our strategic thought. For numerous reasons, challenges with attribution, easily altered payloads, and ease of proliferation, cyber is the ideal tool for gray zone conflict. The information domain, including cyberspace, is where our forces are engaged against our adversaries daily. As the nation uh, comes to realize that this domain is as important as any other, we need the, de the Defense Department to adapt to ensure that any conflict with adversaries remains in the information space as much as possible and never moves into the kinetic realm. As we push the Department to adapt toward the information environment, congressional oversight has never been more necessary. It is the mechanism by which we monitor the activities of the executive branch and ensure compliance with relevant statute. While I understand that, that transitions can result in disconnects uh, and, or misunderstandings, I anticipate uh, hearing from the committee staff that any issues that may have arisen uh, will, quickly, will be quickly resolved to our satisfaction. So I'm happy to add uh, detail in private, uh, but we'll leave it at that for now. So with that, I now want to thank our witnesses again for appearing before us today. As a reminder, after this open session, uh, we'll move to the CVC auditorium uh, for a, a closed uh, member-only session. With that, I want to turn now to Ranking Member Gallagher for his remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to General Noxoni and Mrs. Eo Yang for being here today. Uh, cyberspace is the ultimate gray zone in which operations often do not fit neatly into either traditional kinetic war fighting uh, or non-traditional activities. Uh, adversaries like China and Russia, as well as non-state actors, are continuously exploiting the gray zone and probing our networks and exploiting our vulnerabilities in cyberspace. I mean, just in recent months, we've had solar winds, we've had Microsoft Exchange, we had Russian cyber actors last week shut down a major US pipeline, highlighting the cyber threat posed to our critical infrastructure from actors anywhere in the world and how actors all over the world can reach out and touch all of our constituents, no matter where and our districts are. Um, I just would say, uh, though our, our cyber adversaries are diffuse and evolving and they've proved time and again that our, our cyber networks are only as strong as the weakest link, um, our operations and capabilities have also evolved, in large part due to the work of this subcommittee and the leadership of General Nakasone at uh, U.S. Cyber Command, and in particular, General, uh, the input that you provided to the Cyberspace Solarium Commission uh, over the last two years, uh, which took up a lot of uh, 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 Representative Langevin and my work over the last couple of years. Um, but as we continue to harden our networks and improve our capabilities, the President's budget must focus on modernizing DOD's platforms. We must consider cutting legacy platforms out of date for modern conflict and investing in emerging technologies in cyber. And I believe I speak for everyone here when I say, I hope to see a budget that recognizes the importance of our cyber mission force invests in necessary cyber infrastructure, including technology and human capital, highlights necessary cyber authorities, and really pushes the department out of its silos and into a streamlined structure that prioritizes cyber agility and responsiveness. Our cyber mission force has also matured, but we must continue to identify cyber talent and train, equip, and support our cyber force to improve our capabilities across the cyber continuum and maintain superiority over hostile cyber actors. So we took a lot of 
pivotal steps in this direction in last year's NDAA, and I know we will continue to make progress towards our cyber goals again this year, but the fundamental shift in thinking about cyber will take more than just directives in the NDAA. It will require leaders at DOD and throughout the government and in Congress to think strategically and acknowledge that cyber is now the critical domain to every facet of our national security. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today, and I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Gallagher, for your remarks. Uh, with that, uh, I'll now turn it over to Ms. Oyang and General Nakasone for five minutes of remarks each. Uh, Ms. Oyang, uh, you are recognized. You may proceed. Thank you, Chairman Langevin, Representative Gallagher, and members of the committee. I'm pleased to be here with General Nakasone, the commander of U.S. Cyber Command, to report the progress that the Department of Defense has made in achieving the Department's objectives in cyberspace. This afternoon, I'm testifying in my uh, role as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Cyber Policy. In that role, I'm responsible for advising the Secretary and Deputy Secretary on cyberspace policy and the development of the Department's cyber strategy and other cyberspace policy. Um, Congress has demonstrated that it views cyber defense as a priority through not only its legislative work, but through member service on the Solarium Commission. And for that, we are grateful for your ongoing support for this crucial issue um, in a broad and bipartisan manner. To start, I would like to offer our perspective on the current global strategic context. As you know, 2020 was a year of turmoil with a global pandemic drastically altering our day-to-day -day reality and increasing our dependence on the internet. Our adversaries took notice of our growing reliance on technology. Cyber criminals and nation state actors alike took advantage of COVID-19 by unleashing ransomware on healthcare facilities, targeting vaccine production and supply chains, exploiting fears to spread disinformation, and even disrupting pipeline companies. As a result, the cyberspace domain is both more important and more contested than it has been in recent memory. Enhancing the security of cyberspace, both in the United States and around the world, is a top priority. As the President's interim national security strate uh, strategic guidance prioritizes cybersecurity and pledges to expand investments needed to defend the nation against malicious cyber activity and cyber attack. Our competitors are using their cyber capabilities to seek political, economic, information, and military advantages, and to undermine our security by engaging in malicious cyber activity. The DNI assesses that cyber threats from nation states, particularly China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, and their surrogates, will remain acute both in day-to-day -day competition and to seek advantage in armed conflict. As Secretary Austin said at his confirmation hearing in January, China is the pacing threat for the department, including in cyber operations. China uses cyber operations to erode U.S. military overmatch and economic vitality, stealing U.S. intellectual property and research. Chinese malicious cyber activity continues to this day. Russia also continues to be a highly sophisticated and capable adversary, integrating malicious cyber activities, including espionage and influence operations, in mutually reinforcing ways to achieve its objectives. They engage in a wide range of malign cyber activities, including attempts to interfere with U.S. elections, spreading ransomware, such as not Petya, efforts to disrupt the postponed Tokyo Olympics, and most re the most recent solar winds attack. In addition to using cyberspace as an offensive tool, China and Russia view the internet as a mechanism to control and intimidate their own populations. While the United States advocates for an open, interoperable, secure, and reliable internet, China and Russia have created and employed a digital authoritarian model using their technological and cyberspace capabilities to manipulate narratives, repress free speech, surveil their citizens, and quash dissent domestically. China seeks to export digital authoritarianism to other repressive regi regimes, remaking the internet in its image. Beyond China and Russia, we remain concerned about the cyber threat posed by Iran and North Korea and further nation-state actors such as criminals, terrorists, and violent extremists continue to leverage the Internet to uh, advance their agendas. The line between nation-state and criminal actors is increasingly blurry as nation-states turn to criminal proxies as a tool of state power, then turn a blind eye to the cybercrime perpetrated by the same malicious actors. This is a common practice for Russia, whose security services leverage cybercriminals while shielding them from prosecution for crimes they commit for personal benefit. We have also seen some states allow their, governor, their government hackers to moonlight as cyber criminals. This is not how responsible states behave in cyberspace, nor can responsible states condone shielding of this criminal behavior. The president has made clear also the, nest, the need to strengthen our alliances. 
The department is driving new approaches to do that, and we continue hunt forward operations with partners even during pandemic, and cyber exercises such as Cyber Flag to help our allies prepare for uh, adversary actions. Um, President Biden is currently conducting a review of national strategy, which will culminate in the issuance of two key documents, the national security strategy and the national cyber strategy. The president's guidance will inform our own upcoming defense level review of the national defense strategy and follow on um, national department's second ever cyber posture review, which will evaluate our ability to execute national and departmental level strategies to achieve our goals in cyberspace. We look forward to delivering the strategy and posture review to Congress once they are completed. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I look forward to the members' questions. Thank you, Ms. Ouyang and uh, John Noxoni. You are now recognized five minutes. Chairman Langevin, Ranking Member Gallagher, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, I'm honored to be here and testify beside Secretary Ouyang and represent the men and women of U.S. Cyber Command. Three major incidents over the past six months demonstrate the importance of cybersecurity to our nation. Well-resourced and sophisticated adversaries are exploiting gaps in the nation's ability to monitor U.S. cyberspace infrastructure while conducting operations from within the boundaries of the United States. The SolarWinds incident occurred through the highly skilled means of an adversary against a U.S. company's supply chain. At nearly the same time, the server hack associated with Microsoft Exchange showcased the ability of another adversary to exploit vulnerabilities and attack systems around the world. The Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack also demonstrate a growing trend of companies and even government agencies being held hostage by malicious cyber actors. These cases demonstrate the broadening scope, scale, and sophistication employed by some adversaries. The United States government, in tandem with industry partners, must improve its defensive posture to prevent and or minimize the impacts while contesting and defeating those who would exploit such vulnerabilities and target American companies and citizens. Cybersecurity is national security. Over the past year, I emphasized the importance of defending the election against foreign interference. We did this through the Election Security Group, a combined team from U.S. Cyber Command and the National Security Agency. We built on lessons from earlier operations and honed partnerships with the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Department of Homeland Security Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, sharing information with those who needed it as fast as possible. We also worked with the National Guard Bureau to create a mechanism that enabled Guard units to share information about incidents quickly, easily, and uniformly. U.S. Cyber Command conducted more than two dozen operations to get ahead of foreign threats before they interfered with or influenced our elections in 2020. I am proud of the work the Command and the Election Security Group performed as part of a broader government effort to deliver a safe, secure 2020 election. CyberCom is building on recent guidance from the department, seeking to promote readiness, improve training, and attract high-end talent. The cyberspace environment has changed significantly over the past years. To your point, Chairman, even over the past 14 months, we've seen a tremendous difference in the environment. Adversaries are demonstrating a changed risk calculus. They are undertaking malign activities in cyberspace at greater scope, scale, and sophistication. They desire to take on the U.S. in cyberspace below the level of armed conflict. To defend our security and our interests in this environment, U.S. Cyber Command must continue to adapt, innovate, partner, and succeed against such adversaries. The men and women at U.S. Cyber Command look forward to working with this committee and are truly grateful for the support Congress has given to our command. Again, thank you for your support, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General Naksoni. Um and Ms. Ouyang for your, your testimony here today. Um, before we begin to uh, proceed to questions, I just want to thank you again for your commitment to the national security of the United States. And I wanted to just uh, point out as a matter of personal privilege, uh, we all recognize that uh, our nation is uh, one giant melting pot, and uh, I think diversity is something to be celebrated. And I think this may be a historic first for, uh, for this committee in that we have two members of the AAPI community testifying before us at the same time. So pretty cool to note, and uh, thank you again. Very good. Uh, 
Well, thank you both for, for being here again for your testimony and your commitment to uh, the national security of the United States. Uh, and uh, thank you for your remarks. We're going to now proceed with questions. Uh, each member will be recognized for five minutes, uh, beginning with myself. And Ms. So Yang, I want to start with you, if I could. So the Assistant Secretary uh, of Defense for Special Operations and Low-Intensity Conflict is responsible for uh, information operations. But uh, the Assistant Secretary um, uh, of Defense for Homeland Defense and Global Security is responsible for cyberspace operations. Can you explain the logic as to why uh, two separate chains uh, are established for operations within the same information environments? Mr. Chairman, um, I appreciate the question here. I think I, I'm not sure that I um, am, can give the full history on how that evolved from uh, the department's perspective in terms of why those two things are in separate silos. Um, agree that there is a fair amount of overlap there. Um, but as you may know, the PSYOPs, information ops, had traditionally been held in the um, the special operations community. Um, and as cyberspace grew up, it it went through a number of evolutions and has found itself within the homeland defense and global security arena, in part because of the focus, I think, on the homeland security aspects of cybersecurity. But certainly there are some cha coordination challenges in the division between the two. So to that point, you know, uh, it, how do you and the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Counterterrorism, a position that uh, owns the information operations portfolio, uh, for OSD policy, coordinate and collaborate. I'm in regular communication with my colleagues, and we are um, we are collaborating at all levels between our two offices, Mr. Chairman. Okay. That's something that we're going to have to continue to work on. I think too, though. Um, um, General Nakasone, um, one of the Solarium uh, Cyberspace Solarium Commission's uh, key uh, uh, outstanding questions. Uh, uh, as to whether was uh, was whether the uh, cyber mission force uh, designed uh, now nine years ago was properly sized, um, you may remember that I asked you about this uh, at last year's hearing. Uh, we spoke about this yesterday when you and I met, uh, also in my office. Uh, but last year you had replied uh, that you uh, needed more relevant data, uh, and without discussing the contents of the president's budget uh, before its release. Can you tell us uh, about whether you uh, uh, acquired the information necessary to make a decision on the size of the force and what insights you gleaned from this information? Chairman, thank you. Um, we do have the data. Uh, and uh, again, to your point, not to get ahead of the, uh, the budget submission, but in general terms, uh, uh, I would anticipate that as we, uh, as we lay out the case, uh, we have to look at some critical elements that will influence the future size of the cyber mission force. Now 133 teams uh, in the future, we have to account for the growing importance of space. Uh, I think we have to account for the importance of what we're seeing with malign cyber actors, whether or not it's uh, Russian cyber actors, Chinese cyber actors, Iranian cyber actors, and their intent. And I think the, the last piece is, is that uh, we are in a period of strategic competition. Uh, and I think the word is competition. So we have to have that balance of not only what we are going to support our fellow combatant commands uh, if uh, conflict was to break out, but also if our adversaries are operating below the level of armed conflict every single day, what type of force do we need to be able to ensure that we can counteract that, much in the same way that we have done in our support to the national elections? Thank you, General. Um, and uh, recently, one of your uh, subordinate commands, Army Cyber Command, established uh, an information warfare operations center. At, uh, at nearly the exact same time, U.S. Army Special Operations Command at Fort Bragg separately established an information warfare center. So acknowledging that this uh, is uh, Army specific, it points to a wider issue about lack of clarity on mission sets uh, and an absence of direction inside the department. How do you uh, distinguish what Cyber Command uh, and its Cyber Focus Subordinate Commands do versus what Special Operations Command and its soft-centric uh, subordinate elements do? 
Chairman, have a very, very close and uh, enduring partnership with U.S. Special Operations Command under the, uh, the leadership of General Rich Clark. Uh, we talk frequently on this. To provide a bit of perspective on this, I, uh, I see it as uh, only natural that Special Operations Command, as they operate across all the different domains, also has a capability within cyberspace. I think the delineation is, you know, what is the focus of U.S. Special Operations Command? What is the focus of U.S. Army Cyber Command? What is the overall focus of U.S. Cyber Command? I, I think we have worked through that. I think, to your point, there's still work to do in our doctrine. We will continue to, to advocate for that work. Uh, but we all realize that it's more than, um, you know, just conducting one cyberspace operations. It's the entire information domain that we have to understand and be able to operate within. Thank you, General. Um, I'll hold there and uh, turn to the ranking member for his questions now. Uh, thank you. Uh, General, you mentioned the challenge in the colonial pipeline context of of ransomware and, and criminal groups. And I think it's safe to say that challenge is only gonna grow in, in the short term. Part of the problem that strikes me is a, an authorities problem. I'd be curious, to the extent you can answer an open session, what tools you believe you have in your kit to get at that challenge? Because I believe you also mentioned that as NSA director, you're limited in obviously monitoring domestic US IT infrastructure. Do you think your cybercom forces could be provided under DSCA to DHS, for example, and used to conduct this sort of monitoring analysis under DHS authorities, at least until DHS builds its own capabilities. How do we get this, get at this in the short term while we sort of build out a, a longer term answer? Ranking member, I, I think to your initial point, it's really important to look at this uh, as a broader uh, element and how do we get after uh, this criminal activity? Uh, I think this is a whole of government effort. Uh, in the United States, it is most appropriate that lead federal agencies, obviously Department of Homeland Security, Federal Bureau of Investigation, I don't think there's any uh, a problem with the authorities in terms of what it's, uh, what it's uh, stated out to do. But as we look at ransomware and as we uh, continue to peel this back, as we see criminal actors that are operating outside the United States, uh, I think what the administration obviously is, is moving towards is how do we have a whole of government approach that in, brings together our levels of power that includes diplomacy and certainly uh, our economic and if necessary and if authorized uh, outside the United States what the Department of Defense might do. To your last point, uh, Ranking Member, uh, with regards to support for an incident like this, well-established processes, as you know, defense support to civil authorities, uh, and I think that those would be executed if lead federal agencies needed to, to have that as support. Well, as we attempt to step back and look at it holistically, I think it's fair, at least with one lens, to look at it as um, not just as the, this attack isolated, but as a Russia problem, right? And part of the problem is you, at times opaque relationships between the Russian government and, and criminal groups. Do we have the sufficient analytical capacity to tease out those relationships, make those distinctions? Is there more regional expertise that we need to apply to this problem? I'd be curious to the extent, again, the extent you can answer in this session, how you think about those opaque relationships and our ability to better understand them. Uh, quite simply, I think about it in terms of how do I provide the most intelligence I can as the director of the National Security Agency or Commander U.S. Cyber Command that provides both a, a, a viewpoint on intent and capability of our adversaries. Uh, I think, you know, as, as any director of uh, uh, a combat support agency would share with you is uh, we need to do more. Uh, and we can talk a little bit more in, in closed session today, but uh, again, I, I think that overall we have work to do across U.S. Cyber Command and the National Security Agency. And then finally, uh, one of the... Uh, Cyberspace Solarium Commission recommendations that we are working on right now is this concept of systemically important critical infrastructure, which this case obviously brings up. Um, do you support the idea of creating a codified relationship between the United States government and critical functions? Uh, Congressman, I, I would say I support anything that is going to ensure the security of our critical infrastructure and key resources. My experience has been with elections. But there are 16 other sectors, uh, and I think that what the administration has laid out in the 100-day plan initially with regards to energy is, is a great start where we need to figure out how do we bring the, the whole parts of the government and 
particularly important, how do we bring the private sector into a greater partnership to ensure that we have outcomes that will lead to greater resiliency and uh, obviously security? Thank you. I, I guess the clock doesn't count down when you're up this high on the dais, which is interesting, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll still yield back. Well, we've, we follow the, uh, the lead of the chair and ranking member of the full committee that the, the chair and ranking member of the subcommittee are not on the <laughs> clock, but uh, with that, um, I want to now uh, thank you for your, your line of questions, and I also want to commend uh, the ranking member for his leadership as uh, co-chair of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. I was proud to serve in the commission with you and uh, really appreciate uh, uh, your commitment to our national security. That uh, uh, report was um, went a long way, I think, toward getting to us to a stronger place in cyberspace. Uh, with that, I want to recognize now Mr. Larson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ranking Member Gallagher, we'll see the clock ticking now that uh, um, we're on to others. Uh, General Noxoni. <laughs> General Noxoni, uh, Section 1729 of the NDA uh, required a conference and evaluation by the SECDEF, uh, basically on how to use the cyber capabilities of the National Guard. Do you have an update on uh, the status of, of uh, that evaluation. Uh, Congressman, I, I would have to defer to uh, the Secretary if she has one. I personally don't have one, um, uh, but certainly we can take that for the record uh, if necessary, Congressman. That's great. Thank uh, Perhaps, Secretary. Um. Um, so, Ms., uh, Mr. Larson, just wanted to clarify, uh, since we've had a number of congressional interest provisions on National Guard, exact uh, which of the provisions are we referring referring to? Uh, cyber, cyber capabilities and interoperability of the National Guard it requires a, a comprehensive evaluation by SECDEF on the mechanisms by which the department is able to improve the utilization of cyber capabilities resident in the National Guard. Um, our understanding is that we should have an answer for you later this summer on that, um, on that topic. All right. Um, I have a, a, a list of questions that are really more appropriate for a, um, a different setting. But um, I did want to ask, uh, where did my question go here? Oh, um, perhaps for General Nakasone, can you highlight perhaps how you're leveraging commercial threat information providers um, and, and how do you share that information? Congressman, uh, we have a, a number of different relationships with, uh, with the private sector. Uh, Sincerely, in terms of being able to understand better the, the vulnerabilities that exist in, in our private, uh, uh, in, in private companies is, is critical for us. This is uh, obviously sometimes a, a means upon which we have early alerts to uh, problems that might uh, exist in the, the private sector. Uh, at the command, uh, I assure you that any type of data is uh, looked at, screened, uh, and carefully um, uh, evaluated for U.S. persons data. And if by rare occasion that we do have that, we will certainly minimize and, uh, and uh, we have processes and procedures upon which to deal with that. And then uh, in last year's NDAA, um, we uh, authorized some language that uh, has Cybercom participate in and contribute to the Joint Cyber Planning Office at CISA. Um, how will you plan to um, implement that provision? Congressman, we've, uh, we've had some experience in, in working very closely with CISA, and it, it began with the election. Um, one of the things that I directed were a series of planners to go over and to work closely with CISA as we put together our strategy for securing the 2020 election. Uh, what we found is that this truly is value added. The way that we do planning operations uh, is something that I think is uh, very helpful as, as we take a look at broad-based problems like election security. We're going to continue to support that. That's been, uh, been an element that the Secretary has emphasized to us and in, in very close partnership, obviously, with CISA. So this will be uh, uh, just a, the first of many steps as we, uh, as we go to, to work this closely. All right. And uh, <clears throat> one final question, and this is um, kind of related to um, operations at NSA, but Congress has just been notified, General, that uh, there's a decision made to close the NSA's on-site child care center. Um, creating a tough situation for uh, employees or parents. Can you speak a little bit about that decision? Congressman, we were alerted uh, several weeks ago by the, the private company that, that runs the child care center that they were intending to, uh, 
to close at the end of June. Uh, we have uh, spent the, the past several weeks doing a, a series of different activities. First of all, working closely with uh, those families that are affected to ensure that they have information and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and leads to other child care facilities within the area. Secondly, uh, taking a look at mid and long term plans. Uh, as you know, we are in the, the midst of a fairly large uh, construction um, work at uh, Fort Meade. And so this was, I think, part of the impetus where, uh, where the private company decided to close at the end of the June. But clearly, uh, it begins with our engagement with uh, the families that are affected. Uh, and it has my personal interest, sir. Well, I'm glad to hear that. It, it Pre-pandemic, we had a child care crisis in the country. The pandemic has exacerbated that. We've taken action to the American Rescue Plan to try to alleviate some of that, but uh, we don't need to deliberately add to the problems of folks. So uh, thanks for updating the field back. Right on time, Larson. Very good. Uh, I thank the gentleman for his line of questions. Uh, Mr. Rogers is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Nagasaki, the, the threats that you've described that we face uh, from adversaries in the cyber world, how imminent are they? Uh, well, I think, uh, Congressman, uh, to, your, to your point, I, I think that what we're seeing right now are adversaries that uh, are increasing their scope, scale, and sophistication. What do I mean by that? Uh, I mean that uh, it no longer is just a, a simple guessing of passwords or perhaps a phishing email that our adversaries are, are starting to use. They're using things like supply chain operations, as we saw in solar winds, or they're utilizing zero-day vulnerabilities, those vulnerabilities that the provider doesn't know about but that an adversary can utilize, as we saw with Microsoft. Um, and so this is, the, this is the world in which our, our adversaries are operating, below the level of armed conflict, trying to do three primary things. They are looking to steal our intellectual property, they are looking to, um, you know, steal our personal Id identification, whether or not that's, you know, passwords or that's uh, social, social security numbers or that's email addresses. And they're looking to conduct uh, interference and influence operations uh, either against our electoral processes or within our economy. Are they looking to do that in the future or are they looking to do that now? Oh, they're, they're doing that now, Congressman. Yeah. So you would urge this committee to act with haste? on whatever you're going to recommend for us to do in this, this year's NDAA? Uh, Congressman, uh, I would certainly uh, focus internally, and I'm going to be uh, ensuring that whatever we're doing, we're doing at a, at a pace that is uh, accelerated. Well, my point is, if you're going to need any additional statutory authority, you need to let us know because we're ready to act. I, I talked to you yesterday about uh, the committee's uh, uh, welcoming of the recommendation from the National Defense Strategy Commission, the, the suggestion of a, a digital service academy to help train up personnel to, to take on this, this challenge. And, and you mentioned that uh, you also had a retention issue. Can you talk more to the committee about the challenges you face with retention of quality personnel in this, in this area? Um, so, Congressman, you asked me yesterday about how the services were doing in terms of providing us uh, military and civilian members to to outfit our 133 teams, and, and my response is they do a spectacular job at doing that. It's not the fact that our services uh, don't do a great job in recruiting and the fact that they do a great job in training and then we develop them at U.S. Cyber Command. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, what I think the most about is how do we retain this uh, superior force, particularly those uh, individuals that are so much more capable than their peers. Uh, and so retention is something that uh, that means a lot to us, and uh, you know, uh, one of the things that I, I continue to work closely with the services is how do we ensure that the best of the best decide to stay with us, or if they are going to leave us, how do they become part of our reserve component, our National Guard or, or Reserve Force, or how do they uh, continue to contribute within uh, the broader U.S. government? Uh, do you think you're going to need some statutory uh, uh, leeway to be able to accommodate that, that challenge? Well, so this is, this is a, a point where that, that we'll work closely, obviously, with the Joint Staff and the, the Office of Secretary of Defense to come back at, uh, uh, with some, some recommendations because I think that we have a growing amount of data that, uh, that can be helpful here for the Department to make an overall request. Great. Well, I look forward to receiving that, and thank you for your service. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Um, and I will uh, next go to Mr. Moulton. Welcome back from paternity leave, and congratulations. Uh, 
Seth, and uh, you are now recognized for five minutes. You're on mute. How's that? We got you. Go right ahead. You're recognized. Sorry. I was unmuted, but I was on the wrong microphone, apparently. My apologies. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your remarks. It's good to be back. And to build off some of your comments on the need for coordination between info, info operations and cyber operations, uh, General Nakasone, a few weeks ago, the DC police was attacked by the hacking group Babuk, which is reportedly a Russian speaking group. They accessed and published hundreds of confidential documents, clearly damaging the public's confidence in the police in the process. In the past year, we've also seen influence operations by Russian entities to undermine confidence in the police and exacerbate societal tensions related to the police. So it's not a stretch to imagine that an adversary could use a combination of cyber attacks like the one connect, conducted by Babook and influence operations to undermine faith in public institutions further. In fact, Russia has clearly tried to do just that in our elections by hacking our electoral organizations while also running disinformation campaigns to undermine the public's faith in the process. How is your organization posturing itself to defend against that kind of layered attack? Congressman, um, we're well postured uh, to, to ensure that we provide the appropriate support to uh, the lead federal agencies uh, involved. Uh, let me give you uh, several examples. Uh, so first of all, I'll begin with the elections. Our focus at US Cyber Command at the National Security Agency is outside the United States to provide uh, the insights on our adversaries uh, into what they are doing. We're well practiced at this, and I think we've demonstrated our proficiency in both the 18 and the 20 elections in doing this. In terms of uh, the recent uh, uh, concerns about uh, domestic violence, again, our focus is outside the United States for foreign actors that might be doing one of three things. First of all, generating content that might be utilized within the United States. Secondly, any type of violent activities that, uh, that are being uh, uh, called for by a foreign actor. And then thirdly, any type of uh, information that's being passed internally uh, with regards to um, gathering against, uh, uh, against uh, 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 the United States in any location. We work closely with the FBI on that. We work closely with the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we will continue to do that uh, now and well into the future. General, how would you characterize um, the interagency process and how effectively you are able to work um, with these uh, different agencies? It, it strikes me as an observer that the, the lines of authority are not particularly clear, and it's hard to delineate who's responsible for which operations, especially when, uh, even just given the example you just described, it's very easy to see um, how a, a foreign actor like Russia can, um, can easily have a single operation that uh, goes into the territory of multiple uh, U.S. organizations. Congressman, I, I think the authorities, at least from my perspective as, as both the commander and the director, are, are clearly uh, stated, and I know them very well. And I know that our focus is outside the United States. I know that our focus is enabling uh, our partners within the United States. Um, and and I, I think I, I come back to the elections. Uh, there could not have been a closer partnership between U.S. Cyber Command, the National Security Agency, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, and the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, to give you an example... Uh, well, the elections are... In General, we're just short on time, but just to give you an example of the problem here is that if, if the rest of us don't see that partnership or understand how it works, then you can have a situation uh, where, you know, you've briefed us that uh, the last election was the most secure in American history, uh, and yet half the people in, in Washington today... Uh, all of one party are trying to make the case that it wasn't. So how do we improve that, um, that understanding, even if it's just a public understanding of how these lines of authority work? So Congressman, in terms of, uh, of the election, you know, I, I speak to uh, attempts by foreign adversaries trying to interfere in the, and influence uh, our electoral process. Uh, and I, I am very proud of the work that has been done and in partnership with FBI and DHS on this. Yes, but you're not answering my question, General, which is that if public perception does not understand how this interagency coordination works, then it's easy to think that these operations are not successful. 
Mr. Moulton, if I may. So how do we prove that? Um, Mr. Moulton, if I may. I, I guess, absolutely. It, it is something that the department works with whole of government to protect our elections, and I think we are very clear with the public about um, the work that we do in this space, but we do not operate domestically, and so we have to engage with the rest of government to make sure that the American people are resilient to misinformation and disinformation, and we will continue to work with our interagency partners on that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's my point, and I know my topic's by Mr. Chairman, but um, I, I think we clearly need to do work on, on that. And, um, you know, if I had time, I was going to ask, you know, when I visit a Marine unit on the ground, are they going to say that they are integrated with Cyber Command? My questions all revolve around this coordination. It's very difficult to do, uh, and, and I'm not trying to suggest that I don't have confidence in your ability to follow your lines of authority. Uh, but let's, let's make sure that uh, that they work well, not only internally, but that we can communicate them effectively uh, to, the Amer to the American public. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Moulton. Uh, Mr. Gates is now recognized five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this very important and timely hearing. Millions of our fellow Americans are suffering right now in their quality of life and their ability to interact with their jobs and their families as a consequence of a lack of resilience uh, to these foreign cyber threats. And General, I wanted to ask you, in circumstances where this opaqueness exists that Ranking Member Gallagher referenced regarding the connections between malicious cyber actors and state actors, how should we think about the concept of deterrence and our capability to deter against some of these more uh, asymmetric threats? Congressman, I think that uh, in, in terms of thinking about deterrence, it really is thinking about uh, how do we impose costs. And that's the way that we have approached it at U.S. Cyber Command within the department uh, in terms of operating outside the United States. When we see elements that are, that are operating, how do we try to impose the, the largest cost possible, whether or not that's through uh, being able to expose them, whether or not that's being able to share the information with a series of partners that we have, or whether or not when authorized to conduct operations against them. Can our fellow Americans who are dealing with the impact of this last cyber attack assume that the imposition of some cost is what's being contemplated by the Department of Defense now? So I, while I won't get into, uh, obviously, any of the operations that, uh, that are being considered, what I would say is that, you know, my role as the commander of U.S. Cyber Command is to provide a series of operational uh, opportunities or, or uh, courses of action for the secretary and the president to consider. Uh, and uh, I want to again delineate the types of options that we'd like to task you to develop uh, as they relate to state actors versus non-state actors. I understand that with governments, uh, exposure and embarrassment can, can be a high cost. Do you agree that with more asymmetric threats, the costs have to be more direct and economic and kinetic? Congressman, what I would uh, say is my experience is, is that uh, the type of uh, threats that you had described that are non-state uh, in nature, uh, our response has to be persistent, uh, that it can't be a, a one-time effort. It has to be uh, persistently that we are going to enable our partners and to act when authorized. I also want to associate myself with the comments of the ranking member of the full committee regarding the workforce and recruitment. We all know why you have retention problems. It is because the private sector pays multiples what we would be able to pay people. And while pay certainly isn't the only thing that motivates folks, uh, it certainly can contribute to a lack of retention of some of this high-end talent. Uh, it used to be the case you know, not too long ago that the brightest minds in Silicon Valley were working on cyber and munitions and, labor and, and lasers. And you know, the Department of Defense was the most important customer and often the most important investor. And now I'm concerned that the brightest minds in America are working on likes and shares and memes and uh, other activities that don't directly connect to the mission of the department. And so I think it's essentially critical for us to follow the thread that Ranking Member, member Rogers laid out to actually develop more of that pipeline earlier, understanding that there will be some attrition. Uh, but a digital service academy seems to be an inspirational, patriotic, nationalist uh, thing for us to be able to do. Uh, I think it would inspire a great deal of confidence both in the public and the private sector. Is there any advice you would give us going forward to, to perhaps flesh out 
that idea from Ranking Member Rogers. So I, I think uh, I couldn't agree more in terms of uh, just the spirit uh, of what both uh, you and uh, and uh, Congressman Rogers has described with regards to opportunities future for, for talent. I, I would only add what we have to do collectively as, uh, as obviously uh, the department and the government is to make it as easy as possible for people to go from the private sector into the public sector. And, and I think we still have work to do there. Yeah, I mean, I, I recall even from our first orientation, uh, the uh, challenges presented by some of the limitations and exclusions that the department puts on people for decisions or recreation that they'd engaged in that then could disqualify them. And, and I would hope we would want to cast a wide net for high quality talent uh, that can make that contribution. And again, the, the earlier you get started with people, you know, we, we get to nominate these great patriots to service academies now, and we see how in the ninth and 10th grade, they're already making choices to try to earn those nominations and those appointments. And so I think that, that, that building that pipeline sooner would certainly be very helpful. I thank the chairman and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Gates. Uh, Ms. Houlihan is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman. I really appreciate the chance to ask questions. Uh, this one is for General Nakasone, and it's nice to see you again. Uh, I'm really interested in uh, digital citizenship and digital lit literacy. I think it's incredibly important, especially in this time when we're, uh, frankly, as a nation and as a world, unclear on where the truth lies. I'm wondering if you could uh, tell us how you, uh, frankly, both of you are ensuring that your cyber professionals are trained on how to identify and root out disinformation and if there's any specific training that you are using for your own team, is there anything that we could leverage uh, or take advantage of to expand to all of the DOD employees to be able to educate them uh, in sussing out the truth as well? So, Congressman, I'll begin, and, and if the Secretary wants to, to jump in. Uh, so I begin in terms of our work. Uh, we have a very, very structured analytic development program at U.S. Cyber Command. Uh, that uh, walks our analysts through being able to understand uh, the information that's presented. I think to your point, this is a dynamic environment. And so our training continues to evolve. Uh, we continue to see our adversaries utilize uh, new means upon which they're trying to, uh, to influence. And that's one of the areas that we have focused on is being able to have that ability to, uh, to meter our training fairly rapidly. And is there anything that you can think of that would be applicable to the broader DOD uh at large? If I may, Congresswoman, um, I know that this is a priority for the Secretary, increasing the resilience of the DOD workforce, and it's something that he has been working on um, as we have gone through and um, responded to the events of January 6th. Um, I, and I think to echo General Nakasone's comments about the analytic workforce, not just at NSA, but at all of DOD's intelligence elements, we do teach a fair amount of critical thinking to large parts of our workforce. Thank you. I'd love to follow up with you uh, both on whether there's any applicability to the larger workforce and not just the analytical aspects of, of our DOD workforce, but the uh, body as a whole. Uh, the next question I'd like to very much associate myself with um, the remarks of Mr. Gates, and I know Mr. Rogers as well are interested in this concept of uh, the Digital Service Academy. I as well am very keen on uh, exploring that and advancing that as well. But in the meantime, uh, highly skilled STEM professionals are definitely um, something that we're competing with with the civilian economy. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the cyber accepted service and how it has either positively or negatively impacted DOD's cyber missions and what we can do uh, in this space more to uh, enhance our workforce capabilities. Uh, maybe General Nagasani, uh, please first. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, I'm a huge supporter of cyber acceptance service. Uh, what are we seeing with it? Uh, we're seeing that it is an avenue for us to be able to go to uh, recruiting fairs and offer final job uh, opportunities and uh, um, opportunities for young people to come and consider a, a career with that U.S. Cyber Command. The other element is, is that I think it takes into uh, account that we have to hire differently. And so we're seeing a dramatic drop in the number of processing days for those that are uh, hired under cyber accepted service. Let me give you an example. Traditionally, it's taken about 110 days uh, to bring someone into uh, our civilian workforce. Under cyber accepted service, we're seeing that drop to, to somewhere in the, the 60 day range. So that's, that's a tremendous drop for us. That means that we get people into our workforce much quicker. Uh, it 
It's a much better sign for those that are coming into U.S. Cyber Command that we're serious about talent as our number one priority. Ms. Oyang, do you have anything further to contribute to that? No, I think that General Nakazuni is right, and building a, a strong and vibrant cyber workforce is certainly a priority, and we've been working with our colleagues in uh, personnel and readiness to try and improve that. Thank you. And with the last couple minutes of a couple seconds of my time, is there anything further that we could be doing in addition to things like the Digital Service Academy and programs such as these that we can make sure that we're including in this round of the NDAA? Ms. Oyang. So, Congressman, if I might, let, let me highlight Dreamport, which is uh, an initiative that uh, that this committee has supported. Uh, I think you'll recall that Dreamport in 2018 was stood up. Uh, it is an unclassified facility just outside of uh, Fort Meade that we utilize for a number of different uh, initiatives, uh, initiatives such as bringing young people in, a series of, uh, of high school interns for the summer, uh, an ability to bring together uh, commercial industry with U.S. Cyber Command to talk about uh, key topics like, uh, you know, uh, new architectures for our networks. Uh, but what I've seen when I've gone over to a place like Dreamport, a very small investment, uh, can have tremendous impact on young people in terms of exciting them about coming into and thinking about cyber as a career. The Thank only you. other as thing that I would add to that. Teacher, I appreciate that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. The only other thing that I would add to what General Nakasone says is that many of the people in our workforce, um, they come to us because they are motivated by the mission that the that money is not their primary motivator. And so the Congress's continued support for our um, the ways in which we can uh, bolster the training and education of our workforce to help them deepen their support to the mission. Um, we appreciate the support that you've given us so far, and we hope that that would continue in the future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, ma'am. And I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Julian. Uh, Mr. Franklin is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, my first question would be for Ms. Oyang, and it's a uh, follow-up really to what uh, Mr. Gates was referring to before asking about regarding uh, the attacks we're seeing that are coming from both nation states and non-state actors, um, specifically with the, the non-state actors that are being financially backed by these states. Do our tactics differ on how we, um, how we attack or how we deter those attacks, depending on whether they're coming from the nation states or non-state actors? Um, certainly non-state actors who are engaging in financially motivated crimes, the lead for uh, responding to those actors are the FBI and DOJ. The challenge I think that we have is that when those attacks first come uh, across the networks and, and impact us, when, those, um, when we see that malicious activity, it's always a challenge of attribution to be able to pull it apart and figure out who are the state actors and who are the non-state actors, which, um, which elements of government would then be um, tasked with the lead to um, disrupt that activity varies based on location and whether or not they are criminal or not. But certainly it is clear that for nation states who are um, playing in this hybrid space, we consider that um, irresponsible state behavior um, and would continue to call it out where we see it. Thank you. All right, thank you. In, in both of your testimonies, you made it clear that the U.S. can't go it alone here. And uh, we have this great need to work with our allies when it comes to cyber specifically. Uh, in what ways can you see that um, we can strengthen our current relationships and then uh, how do we go about building out new ones? And with some of our um, um, tactics like you know, Hunt Forward, have that, has that position changed over time uh, depending on which partner country we're referring to? Um Congressman, I would just say that um, as the president has indicated, strengthening and reinforcing our relationships with our alliances and partners is a very high priority for him. Uh, we have demonstrated our commitment to working with allies and partners in the face of the threat. Um, we have expanded our participation in Cyber Flag, and uh, the president continues to maintain a high interest in, and support for hunt forward operations. I'll let General Nakazoni speak to the specifics of that, but we continue to build relationships with partners and allies. Congressman, I, I would just Great. add um, hunt forward operations where we're obviously coming at the request of a foreign government, uh, work through the Department of Defense and the Department of State uh, has been, a, uh, I think, a tremendous ability for us to, to show our commitment to partnerships and uh, you know, just during the, the defense of the 2020 elections, 11 dish, different missions in nine different countries, uh, you can see the importance that, uh, that the department uh, places on this. Great, thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman, you'll back. Thank you, Mr. Franklin. Uh, Ms. Slotkin is now recognized for five minutes. 
Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you to our witnesses for showing up here. You guys have such an important mission. Um, I want to associate myself with the comments that uh, Representative Gallagher said at the, the top of the, the session here. Um, I think it would be so important to really present a truly transformational budget on cyber. Um, uh, you know, whenever you guys submit it, I think the, that this committee is, is crying out for it. I think that the country is crying out for it. And we know that that will come at the expense of older systems, legacy systems, pork, um, and that Congress has a responsibility um, to help you with that, which we don't always live up to. Um, but I just want to encourage you to be bold and, and provide something that really helps move us into um, the 21st century so we can maintain our military edge. I, I guess the question I have um, uh, for both of you is I'm running this task force along with Mr. Gallagher on the Defense Department supply chains and our vulnerabilities. And cyber has come up at every single session that we've had eight weeks in a row. So can you tell me, particularly in the wake of solar winds, Kind of what Cybercom is doing to look at supply chain vulnerabilities, either access um, by foreigners or um, or just you know whether it's intentional or benign. Can you talk to me about supply chain issues, Congressman? Congresswoman, I'm sorry. Uh, what we have done in the in the wake of solar winds is again taken apart and, and better understand exactly what the adversary was uh, was able to do. And from that, working with the National Security Agency and uh, uh, the Department of Defense, uh, have looked at the defense industrial base to be able to, to share that information. I would offer to you, however, that uh, we are also getting a tremendous amount of uh, support and information from uh, defense industrial base companies that provide us kind of a, an indicator and be more than happy to, to follow up uh, with that in a, in a future session. Okay. Um, the, the other thing I guess I would ask is, um, you know, in Michigan, we host uh, a multi-domain exercise that is uh, Army Air Force and has now been integrating cyber into, you know, the giant exercise. Tell me about what you've done to try and encourage the cyber component of multi-domain exercises all over the world. Congresswoman, what, uh, what we have done is uh, twofold. One is uh, to try to encourage and uh, support the Guard, uh, not only in exercises, but in real world. And so we created a capability called the Cyber Nine Line, which allows uh, any element within uh, the Guard, Air or Army to be able to access our big data platform to share information at an unclassified level with the simple use of a common access card, which is your ID card. Every single element within uh, the United States, uh, the 54 elements of the Guard in our states and, and territories has utilized that. The second piece is, is continuing to support not only within our exercises, cyber flag as, a, as the secretary mentioned, but also within Guard exercises to have robust cyber play. Okay. Um, and I guess, um, you know, this is more of a comment than it is a question, but um, along the lines of what Representative Moulton was saying, um, it is so hard to explain to the American public what we're doing to respond when they see these very visible attacks, whether they're from a foreign entity or ransomware or whatnot. Our constituents, they are on the front lines of these attacks, and yet they can't feel, they don't know what their country is doing to respond. And I know that that's a difficult position for you all. What you do is um, uh, should be under the radar, but I would just note that there is a real sense that there's just no deterrence. Um, uh, on a cyber attack that a Russian group, a Chinese group can just attack us with impunity. They can steal a million records, you know, the SF-86 forms of a million uh, federal workers, and we put out a strongly worded press release. So, so we, we are going to need to figure out how to not just do it in the shadows, but communicate to the American people that we're not leaving ourselves open um, as this becomes kind of the primary form of attack on the average American citizen. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Slotkin. Uh, Mr. Fallon is now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Fallon, are you with us? Yes. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Yep, you're recognized. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, uh, my colleagues have asked some very uh, good questions, excellent questions. And I, I wanted to uh, ask Secretary Oyang, uh, the Cyber Mission Force 
has only reached full operational capacity at, in two, by 2018. And given that personal computers and the internet have been a part of our daily lives for 30 plus years, why do you think it took so long to uh, gain this capability and capacity? Congressman, I think um, while I wasn't here in, um, the, in, in the department in 2018, I think that the, it is a growing recognition of the importance that cyber plays. Um, prior to this, many of the cyber response capabilities for the department were resident in the services, but as we realize the um, need to integrate and think about those things more broadly, the Cyber National Mission Force was stood up, and I, I'm happy to let General Nakasone speak to what the evolution of that has been and the capability that they have developed. Um, I think we are in the, um, uh, it, at the beginning of being able to see the, the 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 role of the cyber mission force and its integration into the rest of DOD's responses, um, but I think that its role will continue to grow for us in the department. Congressman, I would say um, we began building the force in 2014, uh, based upon a decision at the department. Uh, the command st stood up in in 2010. Uh, 2018 was a pivotal year for us. It's not just the fact that we re achieved full operational capability. Uh, with the help of this committee, with the help of Congress, we uh, received the right uh, authorities within the NDAA that uh, identified cyber as a traditional military activity. Uh, and that was instrumental for the work that we did in the 2018 midterm elections. Um, the, the force is mature. It's, it's moving on. It's, it's getting better. It's innovating. It's, it's improving. Um, you know, I, I can't speak to the, the length of time to, to why it uh, took us until 2018 to finish it, but what I can speak to is, is that i um, very proud of the, the work that it's is done and where we're headed. Well, General, I would say thank you for the, uh, your answer, but I, I would a little bit more concerned, not so much that we finished uh, the beginning, really, or that we had the end of the beginning in 2018, but we didn't start until 2014. I think this is something that probably should have been done uh, back when you were a company grade officer in the 90s. Uh, and it's unfortunate that it hasn't happened. It seems like we're playing a little catch up since 2018. General, uh, what, are, what do you see as the not not notable accomplishments that have been achieved by your command? Congressman, uh, I, would, uh, I would begin with uh, security of uh, the elections in 2018 and 2020. Uh, a much different uh, result uh, that came about based upon, again, the authorities that, uh, that, uh, were, uh, that came to us from both uh, the legislative and the executive branch. Uh, there are other series of operations that have been conducted since then that I would welcome to, to be able to comment this afternoon uh, in a different form. Uh, but I think I would close with uh, just the ability for the services and the department to evolve pretty quickly in terms of not only the fact that we stood up a force, but the fact that the services now have established cyber services and cyber branches, and then being able to to move quickly to to react to uh, how we need to to outfit those forces. General, what kind of collaboration exists between cyber, uh, Cybercom and uh, DHS's uh, CISA? Uh, daily collaboration, Congressman. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a, a series of planners that are there. We have worked uh, such uh, initiatives as um, you know the protection of the vaccines uh, within the, this. Uh, this country, we have also looked at uh, a series of uh, exercises to posture ourselves for support to, to DHS in the event of uh, uh, of a crisis. Uh, so that's it's an ongoing, ro robust relationship with uh, CISA. Uh, thank, thank you, General Secretary, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Fallon. Uh, Ms. Escobar is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Really appreciate the opportunity. Um, many thanks also to our witnesses for their service to our country as well as uh, for their giving their expertise at this subcommittee. You know, as, as our daily lives and as more of our security and the utilities that we depend on um, uh, migrate toward the web, and as we see uh, recent attacks like what we saw with Colonial Pipeline, the, the urgency of this issue uh, could not be more pressing for our committee. I'm, I'm very interested in exploring innovation in general. You mentioned uh, innovation and, and Secretary Oyang, you did as well. Um, but Secretary Oyang, I'd like to explore a little bit more 
um, the department's initiatives to engage institutions of higher learning, not just for recruitment when it comes to cyberspace, but also as partners for this badly needed innovation. The University of Texas at El Paso in my home district is a national center of academic excellence in cyber operations. And so I'm curious about just how much the, the department prioritizes collaboration with universities, um, what, you know, as you described, DOD's key partners outside the US government. And I wanna give you a chance to elaborate on this. And again, not just in, in terms of recruitment, but also as a, as a key partner. Yes, absolutely, Congresswoman. Um, research universities um, like UTEP and others who have a focus on cyber do provide tremendous benefit to the nation. Um, universities, as part of our research and engineering efforts in the department, are a, a key source of ideas and innovation for us, and we have prioritized funding to those institutions. Um, we'll have to, we can re-engage with you uh, with, when the president's budget is submitted about um, specifics related to that. Uh, Congressman, if I might uh, just add to the secretary's comments, uh, as you well know, uh, the National Security Agency sponsors over 300 centers of academic excellence uh, in the United States, of which I believe UTEP, as you indicated, is one of them. We will continue to do that as an agency. It's critical, not only in the, the sense, as you noted, with regards to the development of our, our young people, but also in the development of curriculum that changes and matters to uh, what our universities are, are working on. So. I think this is a rich partnership that we will certainly continue well into the future. General, I really appreciate that. And you know, one of the, the things that I would add in, in, in addition to bringing that, uh, that innovation that universities and institutions of higher learning can, can bring, an institution, as you know, like UTEP, which is a Hispanic serving institution, brings badly needed diversity to uh, the way that we operate as a country, as a government. Um, and, and so I, I appreciate that. And I look forward to continuing to work with you all on, on ways to expand opportunities for institutions like UTEP, but also to, to really rely on that innovation that, that I think will help get us from out from being behind the curve and, and, and to, to being more in front of it. Um, Secretary Oyang, one last thing. The, I'm, I want to explore the, the Pathfinder program. You said you partner with DHS on this, in which you assist private companies by enhancing their ability to protect their own networks. Can you describe the results of the Pathfinder initiatives? So I believe we owe Congress <clears throat> a more fulsome answer on our analysis of the Pathfinder program. But um, as we see today with the um, interruption of Colonial Pipeline, the department's ability to partner with private sector in order to be able to help them identify threats on their networks is an important defensive step that we can take to help secure the whole of nation. Um, and I think perhaps General Nakasone has some thoughts on, on additional public-private partnerships in that area. So Congresswoman, I think uh, my experience has been, we have worked uh, closely with both the financial and the energy sectors on that. If we might, if, if I can take that for the record though, to provide you a more fulsome answer. That'd be great, I appreciate it. Thank you both. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Escobar. Uh, Ms. Bice is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this very important hearing. Um, and thank you to both the witnesses for joining us today to share your perspectives. Uh, I appreciated your comment, General, in the beginning that uh, cybersecurity is national security. And I think that the things that we've seen over the last you know, week or two especially have highlighted the importance um, and the um, swiftness at, at which this issue needs to be addressed. As both of you know, the DOD currently relies on thousands of data centers that are often stovepiped, disconnected, and in many cases have reached their limits of service life, life service. They can no longer be upgraded to meet current cyber threats our nation is facing. I understand there's a directive for DOD to agencies to migrate to MoCloud 2.0, but the adoption has been slow. Uh, for both of the witnesses, but specifically to Secretary Oyang, could you provide me with your perspective on the migration to MoCloud 2.0 and the degree to which the migration can help address DOD's current uh, cyber vulnerabilities? So as you know, the department takes a number of steps to defend its networks and its data. Um, and But the, as to the specifics of the migra migration, I'll have to take that for the record. I want to make sure that I've coordinated that with my CIO colleagues. 
Thank you. What I would add to that, Congresswoman, is uh, what we have learned over the past uh, six to 12 months is that we have to think about defense differently in terms of as we move to you know, cloud-based uh, capabilities to secure our data, uh, many people think that we'll just put it into the cloud. Uh, it, it doesn't work quite that way. And so ensuring we have the right contracts written, ensuring that we have our defensive forces trained to a high, higher degree in terms of their abilities, ensuring we have the big data capabilities that are necessary, uh, that's what I would add to it. Follow-up question um, specific to that topic, and that is, do you believe that we are investing enough in cybersecurity? I, I, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that. I feel like um, we, we tend to focus when we are looking at budgets on people and um, you know equipment, but we're not looking at that cyberspace as much as I believe maybe we should be, and maybe some of the things that we're seeing now are highlighting some of that. <clears throat> certainly we have tremendous risk in cyberspace and we are facing um, persistent adversaries in this space. Uh, I think that the questions of the resourcing are things that we have to take into consideration in light of the other demands that are placed upon the department and the nation. Um, while we certainly could make use of additional funds, whether or not um, whether how that all works out, we're happy to engage the committee when the president's budget um, is released. Congressman, I'm at a bit of disadvantage because you're asking the combatant commander in charge of cyber to comment on a question like that. Um, here's what I would say. Uh, we have to use every single dollar that is provided to us by Congress in probably a much more efficient way. Uh, and the way I would characterize that is, is that working very, very closely with the DOD chief information officer, where do we prioritize our last dollar of defense? He has done a tremendous job, John Sherman, in, in laying that out. Uh, we have clear uh, guidance from the secretary that accountability means something with regards to cybersecurity. So it's not just the fact that we need more money. We need to be able to use the money that we have to the most efficient uh, benefit of our department. Do you believe on that note, do you believe that flexibility in um, making those acquisitions in a timely fashion would be of benefit to you? Because one of the concerns I have is that we spend a lot of time planning, developing, uh, and then procuring, but, but it could be two years by the time that actually uh, takes place. And at that point, the technology that we are acquiring is no longer um, you know, of use in many cases. How do we address the timeliness of making sure that we're keeping up with these cybersecurity challenges? Um, I do think <clears throat> this is one of those areas where we have to think differently given the speed of the threat. Um, the traditional acquisition models that the department has used for uh, concrete weapon systems are not applicable, may not be applicable to cyber given the speed of things, but that is something that we need to work out with our colleagues in acquisition and sustainment and happy to come back to you guys with some additional thoughts on that. I appreciate the committee's uh, elimination of the $75 million cap on acquisition and the last NDAA that was incredibly important for us uh, because we are starting to now grow this ability to do acquisition at the command. Uh, we need to go faster on that, but uh, that is an example of something that helped us tremendously. Thank you for your time today. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Bice. Uh, Mr. Morelli is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Chair, for uh, this important uh, hearing, and, and I, I uh, want to not only thank you, but thank the witnesses for their considerable contribution to the country. In uh, general, it's nice to see you. I had an opportunity with the freshman class in 2019 to visit with you uh, at Fort Meade and was uh, very impressed with the operation, and I know how critical this is. I want to just end, these may have been question, as I'm thinking about it, may have been asked in one form, but, but maybe you could just drill down a little. I have um, some questions about how private industry, the private sector innovation can help Cybercom address uh, increased cyber attacks, whether they can, whether in your opinion, some of those innovations can. I know the private sector is working on it. Secondly, is whether or not the command is well positioned to implement cutting edge technology from the private sector. So. Um, is it available? Is there help out there that you think you could use? Uh, are you positioned to be able to implement uh, help and resources and innovation in the private sector? And finally, are there obstacles preventing you from acquiring and implementing technology that we need to address that we need to help you either through the NDAA or other means to help uh, uh, you with uh, greater collaboration? And I'd ask of both witnesses. 
Congressman, um, just to, to start, I would say that uh, is there initiatives in, in the private sector that uh, could certainly help us? Uh, yes, most definitely. And, and we see that. We're working with uh, uh, Defense, uh, Indus uh, Defense uh, Innovation Unit. We're working uh, through a series of partnerships that have been established. Uh, and then we're bringing it to uh, you know a common location like our Dream4 facility where it's unclassified. We can have a discussion. We can, they can understand in the private sector what our priorities are. That's among the most important things that, that we have to do at the command is list these are the challenges that we need assistance on. Private sector is seeing that. They, they understand that. Uh, the other piece is, is that I think that um, perhaps uh, what we have to do even more prevalently is be able to have the culture that sometimes we don't have to develop it, uh, that it's been developed in the private sector. So when we talk about new architectures for our network, uh, there's a lot of networks in the United States, a lot of really well-run networks in the United States. We should be able to, to be able to, to leverage that quite rapidly, and that's what we're doing. The last piece in terms of obstacles, if I might, again, just working through uh, our folks and then back to the department, uh, if I can provide some thoughts on that as well. Thank you, General. Uh, Madam Secretary, do you have any additional thoughts? I'm sorry, I can't hear. Uh, sorry. Um, the private sector has a tremendous amount of capability and innovation. I think the department is looking for innovative ways to be able to bring that uh, innovation uh, into uh, benefit our mission. Um, the challenge, I think, is while the private sector may move fast and break things, we in the department can't afford to have things break. We need to move fast and fix things. So um, we welcome private sector partnership to, to work on that. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think this is an important uh, uh, subject. I'd love to continue to be a part of the conversation. It'd be helpful uh, to both the Secretary and the General as they uh, meet what are emerging and uh, obviously uh, very serious uh, threats. So with that, I'll yield back, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Morelli. Uh, Mr. Moore is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, obviously, a very pertinent and important conversation today, so I'm glad and appreciate having the time and witnesses for being here. Um, I think the American public would be able to categorize this as uh, these things, these keep, these issues keep happening. We got colonial, we've got solar winds. Um, my, my, my two questions are for General Nakasone. They're about deterrence and talent. So let me jump into the first one. Uh, we're, we're, we've, we've now set a precedent. We're naming Russia as the culprit in a couple of these situations um, and these attacks. Is, is, that a, is that a plan going forward? Is it, um, is it meant to be a deterrent for future hacks? Uh, will it be a deterrent? Could you provide some context on, on our approach to, to that and even more broadly to, with respect to deterrence? Uh, if I might start, and then I'm certain that uh, the secretary may have some comments on that as well. Um, so, so with regards to what we're seeing by uh, adversaries operating uh, against us in cyberspace, uh, this is going to continue. And so the department's position in terms of defend forward operating outside the United States and U.S. Cyber Command's uh, ability to do persistent engagement is, is what we are doing, and we need to do more of it. We need to be able to enable our partners better, and we need to act when authorized uh, uh, more effectively, and I think that uh, that this will be certainly where we are headed. Uh, in terms of specific options uh, regarding any of the adversaries, I'd, I'd defer that until this afternoon. Uh, but there are, from my uh, from my vantage point, a, a series of options that uh, that we continue to uh, to develop and provide when necessary uh, for a number and, and a range of uh, opportunities for the secretary and the president's determination. Excellent. Uh, Congressman, thank you for that very important question. I think um, deterrence is certainly the department's goal when it comes to cyberspace, but I think we need to be specific about what kind of deterrence and against which types of adversaries. Um, since there are um, some of the activity that you referenced <coughs> is um, what we would consider cyber espionage, and while we, th uh, we would expect that there is nothing that an adversary could do to deter U.S. intelligence gathering um, efforts, there's likewise, um, we may not be able to deter adversary activity in that space to zero. That's not to say we can't impose cost, both by calling it out and making their lives harder. Um, and um, engaging through other means to try and limit the scope of that activity. <clears throat> 
Um, and I think that there are other ways that we can think about deterrence by denial. I would just note that um, in terms of cyber attacks that would rise to the level of an armed attack, um, we have a we have not seen that type of attack from the adversary um, on the U.S., um, from a nation-state adversary on the U.S., and um, we would, I think, continue to maintain a strong deterrence posture against any type of attack of that nature. Excellent. Thank you. I uh, look forward to discussing more for our closed briefing. Uh, quickly, just with respect to the pool of cyber talent in the DOD, uh, how ultimately are we going to be competitive with the with the commercial industry? Um, how can we how, how can we better avoid uh, the attrition that we oftentimes see within the within the DoD that is both a, a an expense and um, you know a dearth of a dearth of talent that exists? So, Congressman, I'd begin. Um, our number one competitive advantage in this space is is our mission. Uh, there is nowhere you can do some of the things that you can do at U.S. Cyber Command legally uh, in the United States. And so that is something that we continue to, to obviously uh, reinforce with our members. Uh, the second is, is that uh, we have world-class facilities, whether or not you're in Fort Meade or Georgia, Texas, Hawaii, Colorado, any place that we're operating, one of the things that we have been the beneficiaries of uh, is uh, a very, very high standard of facility that we operate. And thirdly, uh, one of the things that uh, we continue to obviously leverage uh, are a series of uh, financial incentives that the services, uh, cyber accepted service has provided to us. But it will never be about money. It needs to be about what we're doing in the mission and the folks that they're working with. Excellent. Welcome. Any other thoughts, Secretary? Um, thank you, Congressman. We really appreciate the, the committee's focus on this. Um, and while we seek to retain the best possible cyber talent for the department, um, we do have the benefit of, as we train um, cyber personnel, as General Nakasone's um, personnel complete their military service and return to the private sector, we are also helping to fill a shortage of cyber talent across the nation. So while we need to make sure that we can meet our um, retention requirements and readiness requirements, um, it is not a complete loss for the nation because we send more people out there to defend um, in the private sector space as well. Excellent. Looking forward to discussing more. Uh, yield back. Thank you. Very good. Uh, thank you, Ms. Moore. Um, and with that, uh, I want to thank our witnesses for uh, their testimony, uh, the members for their questions. Uh, to our witnesses, I know that members had some questions that required follow-up and Members may have additional questions that I ask that uh, you uh, respond in writing at the earliest opportunity. And um, uh, with that, we're going to close out the, uh, the open session. 